All right, away we go. This is the last slide you were looking at last week. We're just picking up where we left off. The Assyrian Empire goes for about 130 years, from 745 to 612. The first king was Tiglath-Pileser. He's the one with whom Ahaz made the deal and began paying the tribute payments. And we looked at that last week. The next one is Shalmaneser. Shalmaneser is the one against whom Hoshea, the last king of Israel, revolted. And so Shalmaneser shows up in 724, puts him under siege. Israel, that is Samaria, collapses in 722 and is deported. At the same time, Shalmaneser himself died and brings Sargon, a usurper, to the throne who mops up the rest of that campaign to the north there in Israel. Sargon is the one who then came back in about 713 and is attacking Egypt. And you remember the Egyptians were trying to cook up a deal with Hezekiah who declined. And Isaiah had said to him, don't make any deals with the king of Egypt. Those powerful warriors are going to be hauled away, taken off, captive, barefoot, and naked. Remember that? That's Isaiah 18 and 20. So that's Sargon, and he is successful. Hezekiah remains unmolested because he keeps making the tribute payments. So he's so far so good dodging bullets, you know. All right. Sargon dies in 722, I'm sorry, 705. And that brings now the king that we're dealing with today, Sennacherib. You may recall that regime changes afforded the opportunity for rebellions. Everybody hoped the next king would be sort of weak or that there'd be instability. Otherwise, creating the opportune moment for rebellion. So that tends to be what happens. And this is when Hezekiah revolted, as we saw in the text. This guy is the son of Sargon II. He's most famous from our point of view for this conflict that he has with Hezekiah. Looks like an Assyrian to me. He assumes the rule of Assyria in 705, as we say. Merodach Baladan had been driven out by Sargon in 708. We mentioned that last week. He went into hiding down in kind of the swampland of southern Mesopotamia. He also returned. So the regime change creates his opportunity. And that's why the chronology matches so nicely because it's in this very short period of time that he's ruling now, about three years, that he sends this emissary to Hezekiah congratulating him on his recovery as we saw in the text. So Merodach Baladan retakes Babylon. At the same time, in 705, Hezekiah revolts against Assyrian control in Jerusalem. So Sennacherib immediately has problems on his hands. He's got a revolt going on in Babylon. He's got a revolt going on in Jerusalem. And to make matters worse, the Egyptians, who had been conquered back in 710, as we saw last week, also revolt. So he's got problems left and right, you know. The hope was by all of these rebels, that Sennacherib would just have a nervous breakdown. Assyrian kings weren't given to nervous breakdowns. Hezekiah, in the year 704, as best we can map out the chronology, this seems to be the consensus opinion, becomes gravely ill. This is recorded in Isaiah chapter 38, and also in 2 Kings, we didn't read this text, but he becomes gravely ill to the point that it looks like he's going to die. This is that occasion when Isaiah comes to him and says, get your house in order, it's terminal. You know. And you have this, what appears to be a kind of pathetic moment in which it says, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and wept bitterly. And I think a casual reading of the text may suggest that this was just Hezekiah wallowing in self-pity. And it could have been, but I don't think so. And I think the best commentators agree. This is not Hezekiah just all upset because his own days are numbered. But remember what's happened. He is trying to restore proper worship in, Jeru in Jerusalem after the great damage that was done by Ahaz. 
he's tried his best to bring about a recovery of the worship of the true God. And yet now it seems as if God is still bringing judgment. Hezekiah himself appears to be on his deathbed. The Assyrian threat is mounting. And I think Hezekiah viewed this as a great sign that God had had it with these people. Judgment was coming. End of story. And it may very well be that Hezekiah is expressing grief, not so much for his own circumstances, but more or less on behalf of the entire people. Now, you have to spin the report slightly to get to that conclusion. You know, I'll grant you that. But I think uh, at at least giving him the benefit of the doubt, that's what's going on. In any event, Isaiah comes back after Hezekiah prays and says, okay, you win. God is going to give you 15 more years. And Hezekiah is very pleased. But on the other hand, then it seems as if Hezekiah has a little alteration of his personality and it seems to reflect itself in that odd statement he made well at least there will be peace in my lifetime you know almost as if knowing you've got 15 more years gives you a little bit of a who in this room wants to know when you're actually going to die you know isn't it better not to know if I knew I had 15 more years I'm not sure it would be good for me You know what I'm saying? And I think that's kind of what happened to Hezekiah. You can form your own judgment there. But in any event, God gives him 15 more years. His recovery from what appeared to be a mortal, um, you know, terminal illness brings about this congratulatory uh, embassy from Merodach Baladan. Merodach Baladan knows that he himself is imperiled. He wants as many people in the great playing field of the ancient world in a state of rebellion as possible because that will deflect a little bit of the attention from him. And so he wants Hezekiah in his corner big time. He sends him lavish gifts, congratulations, brother king, this is wonderful, you know. And of course, Hezekiah, not to his credit, gives these guys too warm a welcome. It would have been fine to extend a cordial welcome, but he shows them everything drapesing through all his treasure houses, shows them the whole, you know, kind of accumulated stuff. Not a good move. And of course, for that, he is criticized by Isaiah and told at a time when it would have been pretty hard to predict that actually Babylon itself was the great threatening power just beginning to rise. Still many years out. But nevertheless, this is kind of a harbinger of not so happy things to happen in the future. And it may very well be that it was the, the report of the, of the wealth of Jerusalem that eventually made Nebuchadnezzar so interested himself in Jerusalem. That's speculation, but it could be. So anyway, this is when this congratulation comes. The timing is very tight here, but it fits neatly, perfectly with what the Bible reports and the rule of Merodach Baladin, which is rather a brief one at this point. All right. Sennacherib actually attacks... Merodach Baladin in 702 drives him out once again doesn't kill him but again he chases him down into southern Mesopotamia this is an inscription a kind of picture that's found in the sort of material that's been recovered from Assyrian annals which is depicting Sennacherib on a campaign to drive out Merodach Baladin just happens to be connected to that campaign uh, which is what I say right there. Then in 701, he of course turns his attention back to the the uh, region we're most interested in. So Sennacherib in 701 launches his one and only great so-called Syrian campaign. He comes down, he takes Phoenicia, Syria, the cities of Judah that we just mentioned, quite a few of them, he takes them, takes many people captive. It's kind of this sweeping invasion. Many people escape into Jerusalem to withstand what is anticipated to be a siege, but many of them are caught in the crossfire. From there, Sennacherib campaigns past Jerusalem to a city called Lachish. And Lachish, if you can see it there on the map, is a fairly major city. It's a fortified city south of Jerusalem, north of Egypt. It was viewed as critical that Lachish be be controlled in order to insulate 
Egypt from Jerusalem. So he comes down, he lays siege to the city of Lachish, and Lachish eventually falls, and the forces move to Libna. We read about this in the biblical text. The Assyrian annals concur precisely with what's being described here. So this is, we know this both from the Bible and from Assyrian records. So they're down at a city called Libna, the next kind of fortified city, and that's where the story is sort of unfolding. Well, it's here that the strategy of Sennacherib is, is that he wants to divide. He knows that there's some risk that Jerusalem will appeal to the Egyptians and the Egyptians to Jerusalem for a mutual defense pact, and he wants to drive a wedge between them and prevent any kind of coalition from emerging. And so he's being pretty successful here, and that's what this campaign is about. I might mention this is a depiction in Assyrian annals of the campaign against Lachish. And it shows the destruction of it. It also shows, if you can see it there, a kind of siege engine and all kinds of things going on, you know, and, and the entire picture is in, intended to simply tell how the Assyrians defeated that city. If you go and visit the scene, it still has evidence of this particular campaign. So this is a siege ramp that's at the location of Lachish that you could still visit to this day. Well, this is when Hezekiah got cold feet. When he saw Lachish fall, he said to himself, maybe I was a little precipitous in this rebellion I did four years ago. And so Hezekiah shoots off an email to Sennacherib saying, hey, brother, my man, did you not get, don't you know that it was in the mail? Did you not get it? And so Hezekiah says, what will it take to buy myself out from under this threat that is mounting? Because when Lachish falls, when Libna falls, this, of course, suggests to Hezekiah that his number is next in line. So he's trying to buy himself out from under it, and he kind of wilts. Now, we don't know if he did this with the counsel of Isaiah or not. The text doesn't tell us. It doesn't sound very courageous. It doesn't sound like it was Hezekiah's finest moment. Hard to say. All we know, like Joe Friday used to say, just the facts, ma'am. Well, what we know is that he did make this tribute payment to Sennacherib. Unfortunately, Sennacherib takes the tribute payment, but does not adjust his policy. His plan is to take out Jerusalem. So he's going to take not only what was offered to him freely, he's going to take by force everything else. So it is kind of a double cross because he gives the impression that he would accept this tribute and leave Hezekiah alone, but in fact, we know he had a different plan by the time it's all done. It's during the time that Hezekiah or that uh, Sennacherib is at Libna that the Pharaoh of Egypt. Now hang on to these names. I know it's strange names, but this will help if we can kind of keep them in our minds. Shabiktu is the ruler of Lower Egypt, that is the north. The southern part, Ethiopia, is under a king named Taharqa, who's mentioned in the text. Shabiktu sees the Assyrians out there threatening a renewed campaign against Egypt, and he calls up his friend to the south, Taharqa, and asks him to come and help and, of course, that's what Sennacherib heard about, believing they were coming not only to help the Egyptians, but to help Hezekiah. So that's kind of the drama that's playing out there. Having heard that, Sennacherib sends this Rabshaka, that's a military commander, to Jerusalem to make this great threat. Okay, Hezekiah, we know what you're up to. We know you've got the Egyptians coming. Do you plan to rely on them, that reed that it'll stab a man's hand if he relies on it? You know, we read that text. Don't you believe it? We've got you. You're not going to get out of this one. And, and if you read that entire text, it just goes on and on. He says, hey, tell you what. I'll make a deal. I'll give you 2,000 war horses if you can find people to put on them. Those 2,000 war horses and their warriors won't stand against the puniest soldier of the Assyrians. It's that kind of thing. Just 
trash talk, just, you know, trying to pick a fight. Hezekiah had told the people, don't say a word, and they obeyed. At one point in the text, the, the uh, representative of Hezekiah say, hey, would you please speak not in Hebrew, but in Aramaic? Because the people on the wall, we don't want them to hear. And then the Rabshakeh has just wonderful things for them to, you know, I'll leave that to your reading. But anyway, uh, this is what's going on. That's chapter 18. It's a great dramatic confrontation. So we have the Rabshakeh there at Jerusalem, and then something very strange happens. Sennacherib's army appears to wilt. And the question is, how did that happen? He's there with an immense, powerful, overwhelming force. Nobody has got the horsepower to withstand him. And then for some strange reason, his army just seems to wilt. You know. And the question is, how did that happen? Well, there's three ancient sources that all give us three different versions of what occurred. So I'm gonna give you all three and let you form your own opinion. The first one comes from Sennacherib himself. And this is called Sennacherib's Prism. It's in the British Museum. It's a hexagonal kind of column. You can see it there. And all six sides have written on them in cuneiform details of Sennacherib's various campaigns. This campaign is included. The timing of it matches perfectly with the biblical account. So we know Sennacherib came on a campaign into this region and he describes what happened. Now I'm going to read it to you. It's going to be on the screen here. But what I want to do is remind you up front that this is not detached, sober <coughs> history. This is propaganda. The first true historian that the world ever saw was Herodotus. And we're going to read his account of this next. But when the Assyrians described their campaigns, they were engaging in spin, big time. At the same time, what we know about them is that they would usually tell the truth, they would be accurate, but they would slant everything in the direction favoring Assyria. And if anything was bad news, they just leave it out. Okay. So with that little preamble, let's read the account. I don't know, can you read? I guess you go, yeah. So this is the account from, Hez, from Sennacherib's prism. So this is Sennacherib's own account of this. Because Hezekiah, king of Judah, would not submit to my yoke, I came up against him, and by force of arms and by the might of my power, I took 46 of his strong fenced cities. And of the smaller towns which were scattered about, I took and plundered a countless number. From these places I took and carried off 200,156 persons, old and young, male and female, together with horses and mules, asses and camels, oxen and sheep, a countless multitude. Hezekiah himself I shut up in Jerusalem, his capital city, like a bird in a cage, <laughs> building towers around the city to hem him in, and raising banks of earth against the gates so as to prevent escape. Then upon Hezekiah there fell the fear of the power of my arms, and he sent out to me the chiefs and elders of Jerusalem with 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver and diverse treasures, a rich and immense booty. All these things were brought to me at Nineveh, the seat of my government. Now you think to yourself, okay, first of all, what is included here is perfectly compatible, isn't it, with the biblical text. Sennacherib came to town, he did wipe out a bunch of the cities of Judah, we know that from his own records, we know it from the biblical account. We could certainly surmise that he took a bunch of people captive, people that had not been able to get to Jerusalem in time to escape this kind of blitzkrieg that he brought in. All of this other stuff, of course, is compatible. 
We hear that he put Jerusalem under siege. We know that to be the case. We know that Hezekiah probably felt like a bird in a cage. So that's uh, pretty much consistent. We don't know why, if Sennacherib had such a great show of force, he didn't just take Jerusalem. Doesn't mention that, does he? He does mention that he got all this tribute payment from Hezekiah, and then he mentions, I went home. And you have to say, there's something about this that doesn't quite add up. And Sennacherib has given us a very favorable account, but at the same time, you feel like there's something there that is just not quite the whole story. So, he left Hezekiah as a bird in a cage, but obviously Hezekiah was able to open the door to the cage a few days later and walk out, you know. He was not taken. He was not captured. So there's the account, the official Assyrian account of the campaign we just were studying. Now, the next account we have from an ancient source is from the Greek historian Herodotus. You know that name, he's sometimes called the father of history. He's the first guy really in history that we would say writes kind of detached, objective history. Generally not with an ax to grind. He's a product of the Greek Golden Age. He writes around the year 400. He traveled around the ancient world. He visited with lots of people. And he tries to reconstruct the outlines of ancient historical events up to his own day. And if you don't mind me just mentioning it, it is well worth your reading. Herodotus is very readable, very engaging. I always feel like it's like listening to an old guy with a gray beard just kind of smoking a pipe and telling you stories. But these stories are so helpful, especially when the stories cover some of the same events that we hear of in the Bible. Now, where did Herodotus get his information? He got it from the Egyptians. So the account we have from Herodotus is actually the account that comes 300 years later down through Egyptian lore and Herodotus got it by talking to some priests who were the official historiographers of the Egyptians. And so now we hear Herodotus' account, but remember, this is the Egyptian version of the same event. When Sennacherib, the spelling there is the, uh, the, the way you'd find it in Herodotus, when Sennacherib, king of the Arabians and Assyrians, marched his vast army into Egypt, the warriors, one and all, refused to come to his, which is the pharaoh, Shabiktu, refused to come to his aid. On this, the monarch, greatly distressed, entered into the inner sanctuary and before the image of the god bewailed the fate which impended over him. As he wept, he fell asleep and dreamed that the god came and stood at his side, bidding him to be of good cheer and go forth boldly to meet the Arabian host, which would do him no hurt, as he himself would send those who should help him. Shabiktu then, relying on the dream, collected such of the Egyptians as were willing to follow him, who were none of them warriors, but traders, artisans, market people. And with these, he marched to Pelusium. Pelusium is within about 30 miles of Libna, so they're pretty close together. March to Pelusium, which commands the entrance into Egypt, and there pitched his tent. As the two armies lay there opposite one another, there came in the night a multitude of field mice, which devoured all the quivers and bowstrings of the enemy and ate the thongs by which they managed their shields. Next morning they commenced their fight and great multitudes fell as they had no arms with which to defend themselves. There stands to this day in the temple of Vulcan a stone statue of Shabiktu with a mouse in his hand and an inscription to this effect, look on me and learn to reverence the gods, you know, so. <laughs> now there's the Egyptian version through Herodotus. And again, you notice some striking correlation and some unexpected kind of features. First of all, Sennacherib is described as the king of the Arabians and the Assyrians. Arabia was sort of a generic term for all the bad people from the east. 
He marches in, he's threatening, threatening uh, Egypt, just as we would otherwise understand. The Egyptian army comes out. They have not yet been rescued by Taharqa. He's still mustering an army in the south, so though that was the rumored help that was coming, it hadn't arrived yet. So he has to go out there with basically shopkeepers, you know, Sunday school teachers and other <laughs> non-warrior types. And they are out there and they posture themselves. And then this rather odd story. Commentators sometimes think that in the 300 years that transpired, if there had actually been a plague, in the ancient world, plagues were associated with mice and rats. And so it may very well be that the Egyptian memory of this was this invasion of kind of these rodents. And then as it kind of gets modified, morphed, of course, down through history, you get this particular version. On the face of it, it's a little preposterous that a bunch of field mice would sort of invade and eat up all of the leather, you know, handles and stuff. And then these Assyrians would be helpless against some shopkeepers from Egypt. I mean, the whole story doesn't quite add up. But it does say to us that something striking happens, something really quite inexplicable, so that the Egyptians, for their part, are prepared to attribute it to an intervention of the gods, right? So that's the second version of the story. The third one is the one you're familiar with. This comes from 2 Kings chapter 18. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when, pe when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nishrach, his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Ezra Hayden, his son, reigned in his place. So you've got three accounts of that event. Something happened. For my money, I'm tilting toward the Bible, but I'll leave it to uh, uh, your speculation there as to what exactly occurred. But it is one of the most unexpected reversals of fortune for this great Assyrian king that we could possibly imagine. I'd like to take the rest of our time briefly and just trace, trace out quickly, before I give you my Sunday school lesson for the morning, uh, the uh, rest of the career of Sennacherib. He was not assassinated immediately. He did rule for another 15 years or so. In 700, he launches his final attack against Merodach Baladan. This time, Merodach Baladan is defeated, never to return. He then launches a campaign deep into southern Mesopotamia because he felt like it was a hotbed of revolt. He wanted to get all the way down to the Persian Gulf, control of these Babylonians, especially those native Chaldeans who always were sort of posturing for some kind of revolutionary action. While down there, he's cut off by the Elamites who come in from the east and more or less trap him down there toward the Persian Gulf. And he has to claw his way back over a couple of years, and it's very, very dicey. But eventually, he's able to get back to Assyria, but he loses a lot of people in the process. He is fuming mad. And so in 689, he comes down and does the unthinkable. He destroys the city of Babylon. Now, the city of Babylon was viewed by the Assyrians as a holy city. It's like many people view Rome as a holy city or Jerusalem as a holy city. In the ancient psyche, especially in the pagan world, Babylon had that kind of holy status. And so even though they were sometimes at odds with each other, there was a kind of reverential treatment to Babylon itself, the city, that was supposed to be respected. Sennacherib was so upset, so many reversals in his career, he kind of takes it out, it's like kicking the cat, you know? He just goes down and wipes out Babylon and immediately becomes the most unpopular king in Assyrian history. The people of Assyria are outraged, offended, and horrified that Sennacherib has done this. That creates the political climate in which the two sons, the older sons of Sennacherib, believed that they could seize the kingdom by bumping off the old man. So Assyrian records tell us that indeed, as the Bible says, they came in in 681 and assassinated their father 
while he was worshiping in a temple. The problem is, when you have two assassins, once they've killed off the bad guy, then they turn on each other. And so these two sons, who had just now opened the door for a regime change, can't decide who should be the next king, and a civil war begins to erupt. The third son is a guy named Ezra Hayden. He figures out quickly he's got no dog in this fight, and he actually escapes to, Air, to uh, uh, Anatolia. And while the civil war is going on, he himself musters an army. He's universally respected because he wasn't involved in the, the assassination, which was kind of an unpopular thing to do, even though Sennacherib was not well liked. And so the army actually just sort of defects in mass to Ezra Hayden. He comes in, drives out the two boys, they go up to the region of uh, what we would call Armenia in Turkey or uh, Ararat, never to be heard from again. Ezra Hayden is the next king. We're going to look at Ezra Hayden. He himself is mentioned in 2 Kings, as you may have noticed, also in Ezra, and we'll be taking a look at his rule. He, the two other brothers, we notice this, the army rallies to Ezra Hayden, and we'll take up Ezra Hayden next week. All right. I have two minutes for my Sunday school lesson, not quite as much as I wanted, but I want you to, uh, if you have your Bible still, turn back to 2 Kings chapter 19. This is a wonderful text, and I hope it encourages you the way it encourages me. But this is that moment when Hezekiah has received a letter, a threatening, blasphemous, challenging letter from the Assyrian king, delivered courtesy of the Rabshakeh. Hezekiah takes this letter now, and this is the story of what he does with it. This is chapter 19, verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God. You alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, and, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of, the Assyrias, uh, of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have hurled their gods into the fire, though they were no gods, but the work of human hands, wooden stone, and so they are destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us, I pray you, from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have heard your prayer to me about King Sennacherib of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord, spoken concerning him, quote, She despises you. She scorns you. The virgin daughter of Zion, she tosses her head behind her back, behind your back. Daughter Jerusalem, whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted your eyes against the Holy One of Israel? Oh, isn't that great stuff? Okay, what's our lesson? Four things from this. I'd like to make it three, but it's got to be four this time. Hezekiah spread the letter before the Lord. Is there a Sennacherib in your life? Every one of us, if we thought about it, could name the Sennacherib, right? Somebody, something, some situation, something or other that has laid siege to your sense of well-being. Lesson number one, my friends, lay the letter before the Lord. Spread it out. You don't have, you know, notice Hezekiah doesn't meet with his top military commanders. He doesn't sit down and start plotting all kinds of, you know, responses this and, and strategies that. He takes the letter first and foremost and lays it before the Lord. Just lay it out there. Honesty is the best part. Just get it out there. Notice the second thing he does, however, is worship. O Lord God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God. 
Now, God knows he's God. But we need to remind ourselves sometimes. And worship is the most fundamentally powerful thing we can do to remind ourselves that the Lord God Almighty reigns. And that whatever the Sennacherib is that's causing you grief, that Sennacherib is no match for the God of heaven and earth. So Hezekiah lays it before the Lord, then he worships good medicine, then he makes his request. Point three, verse 19. So now, O Lord God, save us, I pray you, from his hand. It is okay and indeed desirable that we should pray for what we believe we need or want. Bear in mind, caveat, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, we don't know how to pray as we ought. I love that verse. Isn't that a great verse? We don't know how to pray, so don't beat yourself up. Just pray the best you can. Any prayer you pray, no matter how profound, how deep, is misguided. So relax. Just pray the best you can. And the good news is the Holy Spirit, who searches the heart of God and the heart of you, knows exactly what you need and transforms your prayers as incompetent as they may be into something delicious to God's ear. And then listen for his answer. And I love this answer. I used to role play this. If I had a little more time, I might even do it here. But uh, when I taught this stuff in the ninth grade, I'd, uh, I'd always get some lovely young lady with long hair to be the virgin daughter of Israel, of Jerusalem. You know? And uh, the whole scene was she would come up, and then you'd get this kid in the class who sort of was the thug, you know? So you get some big kid, you know, usually good-natured, but okay, you're the thug. You're Sennacherib. And so you got this little young lady quaking in fear like this and this big old, rah, you know, kind of deal. And, and uh, you know, someone like Toby here, he would be good. He's a kind of big, tough guy. And, and then we'd always have somebody hiding behind the screen who's bigger and tougher. And so the way the skit would play out is, you know, she'd be standing there quaking. He's kind of posturing, I'm going to get you, you're in trouble. And all of a sudden, out from behind the screen stands the champion. And all of a sudden, she's filled with courage and she just shakes her head in disdain. Who do you, don't you see what I have here? You know, kind of thing. Oh, they got into it. They, they uh, did, but that, that's where we are. It is not your power. It's not your competence. It's not your might. It's the Lord God Almighty who is your champion. And when he is invoked, he is pleased to show himself strong on behalf of those who seek him, as he did in the case of Hezekiah. Mm -hmm.